the first decade in the crisis of the 1790s. This is the um, this is the period everybody forgets about. And the last lecture I mentioned how the 1780s is sort of the lost decade. Um, this one sort of is too. Again, usually we we do American Revolution, Constitution, and the right to the War of 1812. But the reason I call this the first decade, you know, we, we Americans love to say that, you know, our birthday is July 4th, 1776. That's only, that's just when we declared independence. Again, we didn't actually become independent until 1783 with the Treaty of Paris. And even then, we weren't really sure what we were. All we were, were was divorced from England. You know, we were just a single country now. We didn't really know what we were. And, and, and as the last lecture talked about, we, we sort of, were lost in the woods for seven or eight years trying to figure out what we were. And then, you know, 1787, we, we create a constitution. And really it's the 1790s that we become the country that we recognize today. You know, really the United States of America with the constitution, with a president, with a Congress, Supreme Court, that really begins in the 1790s, hence the true first decade. And I'm cheating a little bit because technically, you know, we began in 1788 with the ratification of, of the Constitution and we held an election. But still, everything in the 1790s is brand new. First president, first Congress, first Supreme Court, and all of our first problems. We also get our first political parties then. Uh, again, we like to say today that we are so divided today and people are so ugly to each other. Why can't we be like they used to be? we've never gotten along. We've always had political parties. We've always disagreed. And in fact, you're going to find out by the, towards the end of this lecture that we get along wonderfully not now compared to how we used to get along. There used to be fist fights in Congress. People were shooting each other. Things are actually pretty good now compared to them. By the way, this weird hat that you see, this is known as a liberty cap. I'll explain this a little bit later. There's a reason why I have that. Um, one thing that will be clear in this particular lecture is even though this is the beginning of us at the same time, uh, not only were we really more English than American still, but the way we felt about democracy, government, what your and my role is in our society was quite different uh, than, than the way we would think about it today. Um, again, we were figuring out the language of democracy. We were figuring out what does it actually mean to be an American? And, and again, um, I think a, a lot of the founding fathers were really assuming that things weren't going to change that much for them. The only thing that would change is that instead of the king and parliament being in charge, they were going to be in charge. But everybody else said, no, we, the people, are going to be in charge. And that's why it's a crisis of the 1790s, because we're really going to start fighting over what does it mean to be an American. All right, let's get started. So first off, just who are we? You know, this is what North America looked like, uh, what we now call the U.S. This is what it looked like, uh, you know, about the time that we began. As you can see, um, most of what is now the United States wasn't us. I mean, you had uh, Florida with Spanish. You know, you also had basically what is Mexico, and that's that where it says Viceroyalty of New Spain. That would be the colony of Mexico. There's also some other territory, the Louisiana Territory, that at this point was Spanish. It'll later go back to being French again. Um, you also have way up to what's known as the Oregon Territory. We claimed it. Russia claimed it. England claimed it. Uh, Russia had Alaska, and Hawaii was just its own little place. So it was, it was, we were much, much smaller, but even the states themselves were very different shaped. You can see, you know, just how strange uh, of, of these states sort of look like. The other thing is <clears throat> we were starting to grow already. Um, 
Maine had already broken away from Massachusetts. That's the one away at top. It's, it eventually is going to become its own state, 1820, but it's sort of already identified as its own thing separate from Massachusetts. Vermont is going to be added in 1791. Tennessee is going to be added in 1796. Kentucky is going to be added in 1789. So by the time the 1790s roll around, we're already 16 states. Um, and there's going to be a couple more added as we go along. So we're already starting to grow. We have quite a bit of territory here. This is what Georgia really looked like. Um, even though you have this sort of, you know, kind of broader boundaries, the reality is what was actually Georgia was still sort of that, that sort of top and on the right there along the Atlantic Ocean. That was where everybody lived. The rest of what was called Georgia was still considered Indian territory, mostly Creek Indians. Uh, out of the Creeks, we get things like groups like the Seminole Indians. So where we are, whether you're in Bainbridge or Cockwood or Tifton or Thomasville or where I'm sitting, uh, Gasman County, Florida, this basically was still Native American territory. Where I'm at would, of course, have been Spanish, but the people living here would have been Native Americans. It wouldn't have been, um, there, there would have been Spanish, there would have been English, you know, it, this was Native American territory. Um, so again, quite different from what we are used to today. Also in 1790, I mean, I, I think it's the sixth sentence in the Constitution was that every 10 years, we're going to start counting ourselves. And I'm recording this uh, April 3rd, 2020. And of course, I, and literally just yesterday, I filled, filled out my family's census uh, survey. I don't know if any of you have, are filling it out. If you still live with your parents, they have filled it out. Uh, but we are counting ourselves in 2020. Um, we counted ourselves in 1790 for the first time. So who worry? This is uh, the return from South Carolina, but it actually has a summary of the entire uh, country at that point. All together, now they didn't count officially Native Americans in this, but everybody else was counted. Uh, we were just under 4 million, 3.9 million population. Georgia, uh, you can see the, the totals there, uh, about eight, about 82,000 there. Um, there were 13,000 uh, free white males. They did, they did divide it out this way. 13,000 free white males over the age of 16, basically adults. 14,000 free white males under 16, in other words, kids. Uh, women, they didn't divide up that way. They just, there was just 25,739 free white women. Um, 29,264 slaves. Um, basically 36% of Georgia was slave. Um, by the way, it's all the United States, 18% uh, were slaves. So almost one in five of everybody that lived in the United States at this point was a slave. Um, there were just under 700,000 slaves at this point. So this is who we are. And so this group of people, after we ratify the Constitution, 1788, it's time to hold elections. We got to pick our government. We got to pick Congress. We got to pick a president. And then the president is going to nominate judges for the Supreme Court and the lower courts. And Congress is going to approve those judges. And then we'll be off and running. So the plan was in 1788 to hold the election. It, it bled over into 1789. This is, you know, the first time we're doing this. Transportation's horrible. We don't have good communication systems. So there, you know, it, it wasn't like it is today where it's one day. It was sort of over a period. And not everybody got the vote. I mean, obviously, um, there were specific restrictions over who could vote. And I always say that America is really the history of a wonderful idea. All men are created equal. Um, and, and ideas of democracy and liberty, but they were just ideas when we began. And it took, you know, almost 200 years to make those ideas reality. And that's just, that's just the nature of American history. Um, so a lot of our history is, you know, how, how did we fail to reach those ideals? And then how did we eventually do that? So when we began, it's again, wonderful idea. Maybe not quite what you and I would think of as freedom and democracy and liberty. So only men could vote. I think most people know that now at that point. Um, you had to own property 
and, and it was about 200 the actual number was 200 dollars worth of property which would be several thousand dollars today in other words you, you had to have some fortune the reason they had that um is basically the the kind of going back to john locke the argument is the purpose of government is to protect property and that includes you your body your you yourself is part of that property if you will but the idea is government is to protect property and we give up a little bit of property in exchange for that protection now i would argue that since you yourself are property you own yourself um you own your labor you you own your ability to say serve in the military that that should count but back then the argument was well since it's to protect property and you have to give up some property to get that protection only those with property should be able to have a say in that government only was basically those who can pay taxes and there's still a strong argument for that today again about you know uh over 50 percent of, of americans don't actually as far as federal tax don't actually make enough to pay federal tax which is why a lot of you probably sometime in the summer will be getting that refund check uh i quit getting those in my mid-20s um so and again the 47 percent are the ones who act and so there are some people today i'm not one of them but there are some people today that argue that only the 47 percent who pay federal taxes should get to vote again you know in other words they're hearkening back to these original ideas so that was the argument only men should vote uh only white men and only those white men with uh 200 or more worth of property it wouldn't be till the 1820s that we get rid of that property requirement because whether you have money or not that government affects you um and then eventually you know african-american men are allowed to vote after the civil war and then of course uh, this is 2020 is the 100th anniversary of when women nationally first got to vote and i say that way because some states allowed women to vote before uh, 1920 but the 1919 constitutional amendment uh allowed women to vote in 20 in 1920 was their first election they got to vote so it's only been 100 years for women voting anyway so this very first election was a really really small group of people who actually got to vote and that we'll get into those uh, numbers in just a minute but the other group that didn't necessarily get to vote were people from some of the territories but also um a couple of states north carolina and rhode island had not ratified the constitution yet they, they they were still debating it so they didn't count that that first election they just did not get to vote um, new york um voted for for uh congress but they didn't actually have a say on the president and we'll get into this in a moment but but there's something known as the electoral college and new york just didn't do it in time they didn't select their electors in time so new york actually didn't have a say in the presidency so three of the states didn't actually have a direct say on uh, who was going to be president and actually most americans didn't have a direct say uh, just under 29,000 people in fact the exact number is 28,579 actually voted you know and some of it had to do with some people didn't know they could vote um again a lot of people were women or African Americans but again going back to the population 3.9 million people just under 29,000 actually got the vote and if you're good at math you can you can do the percentage of how tiny of a percentage of people so again when we talk about a democracy we are talking at this point a very very limited democracy now nowadays unfortunately there are a lot of people who don't vote so it, we rarely get to 50 percent of the population of vote, which is still about you know uh 50 more than voted back then um, but nonetheless, a, a lot of people don't vote, but but they can vote. Uh, back then, you couldn't vote unless you fit this very specific criteria. So again, it was a relatively um, small affair at this point. So the first two things that they voted for uh, were the member, the two houses of Congress. So you had the U.S. House of Representatives, which at that point uh, would have had 59 members um it should have been a little bit more but five of the 
um, seats were vacant. Again, that goes back to North Carolina and Rhode Island not ratifying, yet they'll eventually fill those seats once those two states ratified the, the Constitution and then they get to participate. And of course, the number will go up as our population goes up and then we start to add states. Um, but this is going to be one of the uh, the houses. Now, as you may know, uh, this still applies today. Uh, representatives today serve for two years. So they're not uh, serving that long. So, and the idea is they're supposed to represent directly the people. And this is where I always use, if we're in class, I always ask students, can you say, do you know who your representative is? And I know this is gonna date the lecture, uh, but for the moment, 2020, the US representative for Southwest Georgia. So everyone in this class, whether wherever you're living, you have the same representative. And that is uh, Sanford Bishop. He is your representative right now. Um, but that person, Sanford Bishop, in your case, uh, represents you directly, and you got to vote for them directly back then. Only those 28,000, of course, but you voted directly for your House of Representative. They served two years. The other House of the Senate, uh, at that point, there were 22, um, again, a couple of vacant seats at this point, but... Um, this two per state is how it's supposed to work. Uh, again, as you can see, because we're missing some states, it's not, you know, it, it should be about 26 and then actually going to go up uh, to, I think, you know, in the 30s with, when you start adding some more states. But anyway, uh, the U.S. Senate, they serve for, and this still is the case today, uh, they serve for six years. So they, they're not running for re-election all the time and there's less of them. Um, What's really interesting is that until 1912, you, the American public, did not vote for senators. The state legislature, who you did vote for them, but the state legislature, they voted for the senators. What's what I'm going to keep coming back to is this idea is really the, the fear of democracy that existed at this point. Democracy was new. There was a little bit in England. You know, there, there was some voting in England, uh, property based. But, you know, we were really the first country to try this. And there was a lot of sense of most people can't really do this. They can't read. They can't. Uh, they're not educated. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, that's the other thing about property is the idea is people with property probably, you know, I'm not saying this is true, but this is what the thought was. People with property, with money, they, they know how to read, they've been educated, they know what they're doing. Uh, they're going to choose for everybody else. They're going to be the selected few that actually, the, the enlightened few that's going to uh, make the good decisions for the rest of us. So there is a real fear of democracy here, and it's embedded directly in the way they were voting at this time. Uh, again, the people that directly represented us, the House, two years is all they get to serve. The Senate, six years, we don't get to choose them. Now, John Adams described it that he said that the Senate, their job was to cool the passions of the house. They were to cool the fires of democracy. Again, raw democracy, direct democracy, you and me having directly a say in the government, that was seen as a little too radical. Um, in fact, John Adams liked to say, and he was quoting actually a Roman leader from years ago, but basically he said, the voice of the people is the voice of hell. We don't really want of the people that truly have a voice. So again, the idea of the Senate was to kind of calm down the radical ideas uh, of the House. And that's why they serve longer. And part of that, and this is why they haven't changed it, because there is something to this in that if you're constantly running for re-election, you really do have to do what the people want at that moment. And sometimes when you're a leader, Sometimes you don't always need to do exactly what the people want. I mean, that really is true because sometimes what the people want isn't what needs to be done. And if you're always worried about being reelected, you may not sometimes make those tough decisions you need to make, which is why it is good to have some people serve longer than others. But the real reason they initially instilled it was a lot of it was a fear of, again, the fear of the people. Now, by the way, I'm not going to do it because obviously we're not face to face, but what I usually do is do a quiz at this point 
because uh, you know everybody always gets like that stinks, and I don't I don't like this system either. I I think I think they were wrong to set it up this way, but uh, I do sometimes do a little quiz where I say, can you name the president, vice president? So just in your head, see if you can do this: president, vice president, speaker of the house, senate pro tempore. Uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court today, I mean, any other justice of the Supreme Court, can you name your governor? You probably can't because of the coronavirus, but can you name your governor? Can you name your representative? Can you name your two senators? Can you name your mayor of your, you know, and what, what I find is that most people can't do it. And so the founding fathers would say, see, that's why we didn't let you vote. You don't even know who's in there. Anyway. Um, I still disagree, but but it is sobering sometimes. So once Congress was elected, well, again, representatives chosen by the people, the 28,000 that got the vote, uh, and then the state legislatures voted again for the Senate, um, the Capitol at that point was in New York. Everything had been in Philadelphia, you know, the First and Second Continental Congress, the Confederation, the Constitutional Convention. The argument was enough of Philadelphia. It, we need to spread the wealth. And one idea was maybe every 10 years we'll move the capital to another place because when you're near a capital, um, you do get favoritism. You know, if you go take Georgia, uh, if, you, if you're living in Southwest Georgia, um, nobody really knows where we are. The only time Southwest Georgia gets mentioned is when something bad happens. Uh, you know, a year and a half ago, it's Hurricane Michael, um, you know, in 2018. In 2020, it's the coronavirus in Albany. But generally speaking, you know, and I live in a panhandle of Florida. It's exactly the same way. Nobody's paying attention. But when you live near capital, like if I lived in Tallahassee a little bit closer, I would get some attention. Really good schools in Tallahassee. Um, you know, that's where the government is. You go up near Atlanta, suddenly that's where all the big businesses are. That's where the mansions are. That's where all the good schools, you know, it, you can tell you're near power. So being near a capital matters. And so, of course, every state wanted the capital in their state because they would get more attention, more power, all the benefits. And they thought Philadelphia, they've had it for years. So briefly, it was going to be in New York, but that was just kind of a holding place. Uh, but th that's going to be a big decision. We'll get into that decision of where is it going to be. But for the moment, New York City is the capital of the United States. And this building here was the entire government, basically. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, the president, and Congress would all be in that one building. It's the old New York City Hall that later was converted into Federal Hall. And apparently it was beautiful. Unfortunately, it's long gone. It burnt down. It doesn't exist. In there is another building on the same spot that was built in the 1830s, but it, it isn't the same building. And but, but the description of this is that it was absolutely just a kind of an amazing building inside. Um, so Federal Hall, but they actually weren't there for very long. They weren't even there two a full two years, and we'll get into that in a moment. But this is where Congress would have met. They were supposed to meet on March 1st. That was going to be when they met. And then on March 4th was going to be the inauguration of the president. But the problem was the weather was terrible. The roads were even worse. Uh, only a couple people were literally there on March 1st. So they didn't actually start holding meetings until the very end of March. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be another several weeks before they even hold the inauguration. So the, so, so the government didn't get started when they were supposed to get started. And again, that was just because of the terrible conditions. We'll get back into when the president was inaugurated in just a moment. So um, for whatever reason, people didn't really like New York um, and Philadelphia really missed them. So Philadelphia kind of said, hey, guys, you want to come back? And, you know, many of these guys like George Washington, like Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, you know, basically they've lived in Philadelphia for most of the last, you know, at that point, you're talking about 15 years, you know, going back to 1774 with the first Continental Congress, you know, they had, they had settled down, they had apartments there, they had houses there. So 1790, they were like, Let's go back to Philadelphia. And this is where Congress met. This is called Congress Hall. It still stands today. It's been restored. This is literally where Congress met. So over the rest of this lecture, when I start talking about Congress, this is visually, this is what you should be picturing. 
this, you know, the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, freedom of speech, right there in that room is where those bill of, you know, those 10 amendments were passed. And almost everything else we're going to talk about happened right there. So when we talk about the Senate, and this one, I, I, it's the House of Representatives, there was another room for the Senate. But basically, this is what you should be picturing. So let's talk a little bit about Georgia. I know I'm bad. I, I don't really talk about Georgia as much as I sometimes should. Um, but again, you, if you look at that stamp, you'll see a familiar name. Uh, we're going to talk about Abraham Baldwin in just a moment. I don't expect you to memorize this. Know a little bit about Abraham Baldwin. I mean, I think you should since that's the school we go to. Uh, the rest of this is just a little bit more for your information. Um, so for Georgia, um, again, Georgia obviously was part of this brand new government. There were three representatives at first from Georgia. That will change in a little bit. Uh, they'll actually get downgraded at first. But for the, the first Congress, if you will, the first two years of Congress, uh, Congress, actually the first uh, two Congresses, um, the way it worked in Georgia is you had three congressional districts, first, second, and third. Um, James Jackson, he's a name that pops up quite a bit. James Jackson from the first district, Abraham Baldwin from the second district, and then George Matthews from the third district. Just real quick, again, this is just a little bit more for your knowledge, kind of see how things have changed. Uh, after 1793, after the second Congress, and, and every two years is another Congress, basically. So because they serve for two years. And when you say Congress, even though that really means the House and Senate, generally speaking, when you use just the word Congress, you really mean the House of Representatives. If you mean the Senate, you, you'll say specifically the Senate. I know it's weird, but it's just the way it works. So that so the first two Congresses, Georgia had three districts. Then until 1745, they just kind of went what they call at large because the district is a specific area of a state or of a county. You know, you represent this part of the state, this district, like Sanford Bishop represents southwest Georgia. Um, for a while, they just called it at large. That just means the representatives all represent the whole state. So after 1793, it's because they started adding other states and Georgia really didn't have that many people. They were like, you know, actually, you don't need three. We're going we're gonna to knock you down to two. So for 10 years, they only had two representatives. And then in 1803, they went up to four. Then 1813, they went up to six. In 1823, up to seven. And then all the way up to 1845, it ended up being nine representatives. So, uh, but yeah, Georgia started out relatively small. And then of course, the senators, which weren't chosen by Georgians, but instead were chosen by the General Assembly of Georgia, which of course, was, which at that time was in Savannah. This is when the capital was still Savannah. So it would remain in Savannah uh, until 1804, when the town of Milledgeville was founded and chosen to be the capital. And that name, Milledgeville was named for the guy you see at the bottom, John Millage. Uh, it's actually what Milledgeville was named for. And it would be from 1804 all the way up until 1868. And in 1868, it becomes Atlanta. But that's the U.S. too. We're not going to get into that. So these are the senators. And the, I, don't, I don't have them all listed here. If you look at the dates, you know, they don't quite match up. Again, Georgia got two senators. So one of the seats, you have William Few and then James Jackson again. Uh, and then Abraham. I skipped a little bit because there's like, believe it or not, there are three between Jackson and Baldwin. One retired. Uh, one filled that spot. And then another one filled it. And then he died. And then Abraham. So I skipped them just for time. Uh, but Abraham Baldwin goes from being a representative, uh, flipping over to being a senator. And then the second seat, a guy named James Gunn had it for, for over 10 years. And then, again, I skipped a couple of guys to get down to John Millage. Um, I think... Um, James Jackson actually becomes senator again in the other seat. He kind of keeps popping up. Uh, anyway, just just for your own knowledge, this is just some of the people that were all the things we're going to be talking about today. These are the Georgians that were having a say in all of this. But I did want to talk just a little bit about Abraham Baldwin himself, because uh, he is actually a pretty big deal guy, even outside of Georgia. And in fact, he's not even originally from Georgia. Uh, he was born uh, 1754 in Connecticut. Um, it's funny, I, I think I might have said this in class, but when we first 
merged uh, with Bainbridge State College merged with Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College, and we became uh, Abr uh, ABAC at Bainbridge. You know, all of his faculty were like, "That sucks. That's we don't like this name." In fact, I was hoping they'd give. I, I was hoping they'd come up with a brand new name, like Southwest. Well, the province there's already one called that, isn't there? Uh, but something like a Southwestern College, or I always, I actually liked Wiregrass College. I thought that would have been a cool name, you know. So anyway, um, I was like, "Who is this Abraham Baldwin guy anyway?" Because to be honest, with you, I never talked about him. And so I, I remember looking. I'm embarrassed I didn't know anything about him. I looked him up, and I was like, "Who is this turkey?" And I thought, hey, it's, "It's probably some slave owner, some horrible guy." So it turned out he was actually a pretty cool guy. <laughs> he was actually, even though most leaders in Georgia were slave owners, he actually was not. And he was a minister. He was a lawyer. Uh, he served. You know, he served on the, the Constitution Convention. He, his signature is on the Constitution. He was at the First and Second Continental Congress. He uh, then later uh, served as a Georgia state senator, and he was a member of the Confederation, you know, pre-Constitution government. And, uh, and then, of course, as you guys already know, he was a U.S. representative and then later a U.S. senator from Georgia. And, you know, I thought, oh, it's actually a pretty cool guy, <laughs> you know, so maybe it is a good name. So now I'm cool with the name because the guy's cool. Um, again, he was originally from uh, Connecticut. He trained as a minister, but then also turned, started training as a lawyer. He went to Yale uh, University, uh, which is going to affect Georgia in a moment. And, um, and then he was convinced uh, by a couple of friends of his, to, to, because he was already a big player, to, to leave Connecticut to come to the state of Georgia. So one of the people that convinced him uh, was a fellow Connecticut, I don't know what you call Connecticut, Connecticut, <laughs> but anyway, a, a resident of Connecticut who had already moved to Georgia, uh, a, a guy named Lyman Hall um, convinced, um, uh, convinced him partly. The other person that convinced him was uh, General Nathaniel Green. If you remember from the revolution, um, documentary and lecture. Nathaniel Green uh, was uh, kind of the right-hand man for George Washington, and he was in charge of the South during the American Revolution, and basically he won the war. You know, it was the Battle of Yorktown that he initially uh, sort of set up, and then Washington kind of came in and got all the glory, but Nathaniel Green was a major guy. He was from Rhode Island. Uh, after the war, Georgia gave him a plantation uh, and to thank him for the war and to get him to Georgia. Um, so he owned a plantation called Mulberry Grove. And Mulberry Grove is a, a quite a famous plantation. It originally was a silk plantation um, and then later grew rice. It's right along the Savannah River. Um, the, of course, a major slave plantation as well. And it was on that plantation that Eli Whitney uh, came. Uh, Nathaniel Green died in 1786 on the plantation. Eli Whitney later was hired to be the tutor for Green's kids. And it was while he was a guest at that plantation in 1793 that he got an idea. And of course, this is, I should have had this a moment ago, but this is a sort of a drawing of the plantation itself. Uh, Unfortunately, the plantation no longer physically exists. Uh, it is marked on the highway, and this is, uh, you know, this is basically what you see. And then there are ruins. It's really quite sad that it hasn't been restored in any way, but this is, you know, some of the ruins of this plantation. But again, it was on this plantation that Eli Whitney uh, had the idea for the cotton gin. And there's some debate about this. Some say that he actually physically built the first cotton gin on the plantation. Some people argue that he got the idea and went back up north because he was not from Georgia and then built it up there. But later, if you don't already know, we'll be getting into why the cotton gin is so important, not just to cotton farmers, but to the history of the nation. And, and so again, that happened at Mulberry Grove. So Abraham Baldwin was convinced by uh, Nathaniel Green and Lyman Hall to come, and he actually went to Mulberry Grove and stayed for a while. Uh, George Washington actually stayed there for a while, too, because he and Nathaniel Green were very close friends. So again, it was actually a pretty big deal place just outside of Savannah, uh, along the Savannah River. Anyway, Abraham Baldwin uh, moves to Georgia, does all the stuff we mentioned. But the other thing he did that directly relates to 
what we're doing now. We're in the University System of Georgia. We're at ABAC. And of course, ABAC and Tifton has a very close relationship with the University of Georgia, the very first college slash university in Georgia. And Abraham Baldwin is one of the founders of it. In fact, that's one of the main reasons he was invited to Georgia. Is he was invited to Georgia to help found uh I have fun there. I just realized I made a big mistake. That should be found. I probably funded it too, but it was found in it. Uh, anyway, uh, the University of Georgia, and he became the first president of it. Uh, I think 1801, he stopped being president. You know, basically, his job was to set it up. He got he got the funding for it. He got the political side of it. It didn't really start holding classes until the 1800s, but it took all, you know, they had to build it. They had to get it all set up. They had to hire people. He did all of that stuff. And then he stepped aside and then let it start running. Uh, so that's pretty important. And this is one of his statues at in Athens at the university. And um, it's funny, I grew up a Florida Gator fan growing up in Jacksonville. Now, of course, I'm, a F I'm not really a sports guy, but I'm an FSU guy because that's where I went to school. Is where my wife went to school. My son goes to FSU high now. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it, even, even there, it's still hard for me to see. You know, I'm, I'm not a Georgia guy, uh, but I know some of you are, are obviously big Bulldog fans. And y you ever wonder why you guys are the Bulldogs? I mean, Georgia's not necessarily known for Bulldogs. Well, the reason it's Bulldogs as the mascot for Georgia is because of Abraham Baldwin. Because Abraham Baldwin, just like Lyman Hall, both went to Yale. And the mascot for Yale is a bulldog, and that's why Georgia is a bulldog. So Abraham Baldwin, it was chosen in honor of Baldwin. So anyway, and um, while he was still senator and while uh, living in Georgia, uh, he, or excuse me, a legal resident of Georgia, he was physically in D.C., he died, and uh, relatively young, but he's buried at known, what's known as Rock Creek Cemetery uh, in D.C., and you can see the original tombstone here. Later, his wife will be buried there. And then back in 1943, uh, they, they sort of added a, a new little monument to it to specifically honor the fact that he signed the Constitution. So that is actually Abraham Baldwin's grave. One last little bit of trivia, since, again, I will never talk about Abraham Baldwin again this semester. His brother, who was much younger than him, um, was born, like, I think Abraham Baldwin was in the 30s when this guy was born, but Henry Baldwin later, also went to Yale, uh, later uh, was was appointed by Andrew Jackson to be uh, one of the justices on the Supreme Court. So again, the Baldwin families actually uh, do have a pretty big heritage in American history, uh, and including Georgia history. All right, so when... This first Congress, which included Abraham Baldwin, when they got together, one of the first things they had to do, and again, they're figuring all of this out. They don't know what they're doing, but one of the first things they have to do is they have to ratify the election of the president. Because that's how it works. Um, even today, you know, we have election day. And then, but whoever wins that doesn't necessarily become president. It's not till Congress ratifies the vote, approves the vote, which is today is really a formality, but that's when they become uh, president. And, and, but what they're really ratifying is not the vote that you and I do, even though we you you know we do vote today, but we you and I don't actually vote for president. What you and I vote for, and in fact, hopefully, if you're 18, you'll be doing this in a few months. Um, and that is, you know, in 2020, we're electing, you know, a president again this year. So what you what will happen when you vote, if you get the vote, is because um, I know some of you are in high school, so some of you may not be old enough to vote this year. But if you get the vote, what you're actually doing is electing electors. And then the electors choose the president. Again, today it's more of a formality, but at one time, this is how it worked. Um, so uh, again, there are a couple of states that didn't get to do this. Uh, Rhode Island and North Carolina 
they, you know, they're the two small places in black because they didn't ratify the Constitution yet. And then New York, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't get the they didn't choose the electors in time to actually vote in what we now call the Electoral College. College really just means a group of people. That's all a college means. Uh, today, we only use it usually for for educational reasons, but we still use that term to refer to the Electoral College, although that term Electoral College is not actually in the Constitution. And the Constitution just says electors, but today we refer to all those electors as the Electoral College. They actually vote for the president and then Congress will ratify their vote. So basically what we do is we all go, we would like this guy to be the president. And then the electors go, hmm, that sounds good. Well, we agree with you or they could go, hmm, we don't think you're right about that. We think it's going to be that person. In other words, electors do not have to be faithful to how you and I vote. Even today, that's still the case. And every so often, an elector will vote differently than their, than their people vote. Oh, but I, let me back up a little bit. Every state gets a number of electors. Basically, you take your how many representatives you have in Congress, and then you add the two senators, and that's the number you come up with. Like you see, Georgia has five because they had three members of the House, and then you add their two Senate, that comes to five. 1796, they'll have four because they'll have two reps and then two senators, so they end up having four electors in 1796. Anyway, that's how you get to that number. Um, today it's 16 for Georgia, for instance. So every state gets a set number of electors, um, but not every one of those electors has to vote our way. Now, it has never changed an election. Um, I think the last time it happened was about 12 years ago. I think it was 2004, and I believe it was one of the Carolinas. I can't remember which one. And one of the electors did not vote for Barack Obama. They voted, I guess it was for John McCain. And, but there's some debate about that it might have been an accident. It may not even have been on purpose, uh, but it didn't affect the outcome. And, you know, but they, they can vote whatever they want. And I know you're probably all thinking, huh, what the heck? That makes no sense. And again, part of this goes back to that idea that the, the people can't completely be trusted. They don't quite know what they're doing. So this is like a check. It's like a, a safety valve that, you know, um, again, sort of a safety lining between us, the crazy people, and on the other side, the presidency. So in between us and the presidency is again, this, this, this line of defense, just in case we all go crazy and we vote for the wrong person, you know, and that's the system. And, and the way it came about was that during the constitution debates, um, some people wanted, um, to actually uh, directly vote for president. You know, they, they, they wanted just everybody to vote. And, and again, many of the members of, of the Constitutional Convention were uncomfortable with that. What the rest of the people wanted was to actually just simply have Congress pick the president. And Madison came up with this compromise. He says, okay, why don't we let the people vote and then uh, we'll have these other guys that will then kind of listen and then they'll make the final decision. So again, it wasn't quite Congress doing it, but it wasn't the people doing it. It was sort of this weird in-between thing because the electors vote and the Congress approves it. So really the reason we have the Electoral College more than anything else other than fear is it, is it was just kind of this weird compromise between these two very extreme ideas. And there's been a lot of debate in the last, you know, I mean, it comes up every year, but lately it's really come up. Um, maybe we, you know, and, you know, and I know 2016, uh, obviously that was a very tense election. Um, but at the same time, that was one of those one of those elections where one candidate got more votes, and that was Hillary Clinton, but the other candidate got more electoral votes, which constitutionally that person becomes president and that's how Trump got president. But that made some people uncomfortable. And so there is this kind of debate that maybe we don't need the electoral college anymore. Anyway, that's not that's that's for Dr. Fonso or some other political scientists to debate. That's that that's out of my league. That's out of my pay grade, but that is the debate today. But this is just 
one of those questions I, I get asked a lot. It's like, who are these electors? Because it is funny. You don't actually ever hear about these guys. Because when we hold the election, you know, in November, that's really the election. I mean, the reality is we do pick the president. And, and, and the Electoral College today really is a formality. I mean, you, you never even hear about these guys voting. You never hear about Congress approving it. It's just, no, you know, the next day after the election, we know who's president. You know, 2016, we knew Trump was president the next day. This is all just formality. But there, there, there is still, and these were the electors. Like, uh, just happened that Wikipedia happened to have these names. So in case you were wondering, these were the electors in Georgia in 2016. They are the 16 that voted. Anyway, um, so once we get a president, once the electors, oh, let me let me back up a little bit. So in 1788 slash 89, um, that that one was a little bit different. Um, not every state uh, did it the same way. Um, again, New York didn't do it at all. Rhode Island didn't do it at all. Uh, New York, uh, excuse me, uh, North Carolina didn't do it. Um, Connecticut. Georgia, New Jersey, South Carolina, they didn't even bother having the population vote. They just went, they just let the electors do it completely. The electors actually ended up choosing the president. Like I said, they didn't even bother having the people of Georgia vote at all. Um, so again, so you get a sense of why it was so few people. So that means even less than 28,000 voted for president. Those 20,000 voted for Congress, but it was even a smaller number that actually voted for president. Anyway, um, now it's the Electoral College votes. They and, and George Washington got all the votes, 69 electoral votes. He gets them all. But the way it worked back then, electors, well, first you and I, and then electors, we, what we did was we voted for two names. So you say, oh, I like Bob and I like Tom. And then if Bob gets the most votes, he becomes president. And if Tom gets the second most votes, he becomes vice president. Doesn't matter whether they know each other, whether they like each other, whether they're on the same party. By the way, there was not supposed to be parties back then. But anyway, the idea was um, the person with the most votes becomes president. The person with the second most votes becomes vice president. The person with the most votes, because he got all of them, was George Washington, 69. However, um, for that second name, um, there were a whole bunch of names out there. Benjamin Franklin, even though he he would die very soon after this, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, uh, John Hancock. But John Adams, I, th I think the, the number was like 36. And don't quote me on that, but I believe it was 36. It was in the 30s. So he got about half the votes that Washington got, but he got more than anybody else. And so he became vice president. So Congress ratifies that vote in March of 1789, and finally in April, it's finally time to hold the inauguration. And that's what this is a painting of, is Washington arriving in New York. And this was, again, a very different sort of feel. You know, we, we were no longer a monarchy, so we didn't have royalty anymore. But it was like we had royalty. Because we hadn't, as Jefferson called it, we still had the rags of royalty. You know, that, that was kind of how we talked about democracy, how we talked about government was still sort of in the, um, again, the language of royalty, if you will. Let me give an example. So um, Washington arrived in a big carriage, a big white carriage. And it pulled by, I think this painting only shows a couple, but it was pulled by eight horses. I always think of Cinderella, the old Disney movie, when I think of this. And he had footmen, he had horsemen, uh, the, the militia for New York marched behind them, and then the members of Congress marched behind them. And it was like a royal procession. And he arrives, everyone bows to him. Uh, they call him his majesty or his royalty and his highness. Uh, again, they treated him the way you would treat a king. Um, and, and so, again, it was very different. Now, people in Britain think it's funny, you know, because Americans always say, oh, yeah, you guys got your queen and your royalty. and We don't have that. But we kind of do. I mean, if you think about it, you know, we have a leader. 
um, who lives in a castle. We call it the White House. Uh, you and I can't go up to the person. He's surrounded by armed guards. And whenever he arrives, the military salute him and they play hail to the chief. And it is like a royalty. It's just we get to elect them is the only difference. So, you know, even today, we still kind of have some of the trappings of royalty. Um, but we definitely started that way. So, again, this is Federal Hall, the, the the former City Hall of New York, now the federal government. And it was, as you can see on that balcony, which is where uh, Washington uh, will hold his inauguration. Now, originally, it wasn't going to be public. Um, he arrives. Now, unsurprising, I mean, not unsurprising, surprisingly, there were about 3,000 people outside. Um, and this is right at the, the, the head of Wall Street, by the way. Um, and they just couldn't believe, like, oh, my gosh, who are all these people? So they, they were supposed to do it inside. It was actually supposed to be private. But Washington, you know, because all the people were there, he said, well, maybe it was on that balcony, that patio. We could do it there so people can at least see it. And they're like, oh, OK. Uh, could you imagine if it was still private, how many conspiracy theories there would be? Uh, I always remember in January of 2009, you know, when Barack Obama was inaugurated, uh, John Roberts, who was the Chief Justice and still is today, he was, uh, it was his first inauguration as well. So he was very nervous. Barack Obama was nervous. So, you know, the Chief Justice, you know, says, I, Barack Obama, and then the president repeats it. And then, you know, it goes back and forth. Um, Chief Justice left off a word. I forget which one, but it was just, he just he was going real fast and he left out a word. Uh, President Obama said it correctly back, but there were some conspiracy uh, theories that that meant Barack Obama's not really president because he didn't say it just like Chief Justice John Roberts said it. So literally the next day, John Roberts went to the White House with a camera and they did it again and they filmed it. You know, now the reality is, constitutionally speaking, the moment Congress ratifies the vote of the Electoral College, when the inauguration day arrives, the president is the president. The inauguration actually doesn't have any legal binding. It is just a formality. It's in the Constitution, but it is a formality. It's a nice formality, but it is not required. So the moment the date arrives, they are actually president, even though we all kind of say they're not president until the inauguration speech and the oath. That's not actually not true. Once, you know, they are president on that day. And which date that was originally was March 4th. Now, I've already said that nobody was in New York on March 4th because of bad weather and bad roads. So they didn't actually hold Washington's until April 30th. But uh, after this one, every year until 1936, it was March 4th. They switched it in 1936, and then they moved it up to January because it was the Great Depression. And, and in 1932, when Roosevelt was elected the first time, um, waiting three months, you know, from January, you know, heck, more than that, he elected in November. He had all of November, December, January, February before he becomes president, and things just got worse. And so they said, OK, enough of that, uh, because the president. Like, like if you're the guy leaving from November to March, no one's listening to you because you're considered a lame duck. So it, it's kind of a useless time. So they just said, we don't need all that time anymore. So now they've moved it up to January. And there's even talk of moving it back even further. But anyway, uh, March 4th is what it used to be, except for this very first one, because of, again, of a lot of problems. Um, again, the oath itself is actually very simple. Um, but Washington added a little bit at the end. Again, um, you have a choice of whether you want to use the Bibles. Uh, most presidents have used Bible, but you can, you can use anything. Um, some people have used their own Bibles. Some people have used the Constitution to say the oath on. Washington actually brought a copy of his own Bible. Um, and then when he got done, he bent over and he kissed the Bible and he said, so help me God. And again, because the Constitution doesn't mention God on purpose, uh, that is not technically part of the oath, but every president has added that ever since. So they're all kind of imitating Washington. And if you go to New York today uh, in a building that they still call Federal Hall, but it's not actually the same building, uh, they do have a little exhibit there. And uh, they do have the actual Bible that was used in the inauguration. 
This is the building that, that today is on the site. I mean, this building goes back to the 1830s, um, but it's not the original building. But again, I, I think this was in 2012 and I went up there with students. Um, but and this was freezing. This is this was actually in March. And you can see there's always a big crowd there because it's just a big site to get photographs. It's right there at Wall Street. And everybody wants to go where the first president was inaugurated. And that statue, you see, is about where they think where he would have stood, you know, where the patio would have been. And it's interesting, this is uh, a drawing, this particular one's been colorized, but uh, this is a drawing taken all day. So you see the patio um, and you see Washington doing his oath. And then in the background, you see a church that's called Trinity Church. It still exists today. Um, in fact, I took a photo standing you know you can see the crowd there but you can see i'm standing where i can kind of imitating that drawing and you can see washington and right behind them is trinity church so again they they pretty much got this right and again you know just like today i, I was actually at inauguration way back in 1989 for the first george bush my high school went up there and saw that um and there were people selling t-shirts and posters and you name it they were selling it and it's funny the very first inauguration they were selling things back then it was if you went somewhere you would often buy a button and then you would sew your button on your coat so this was one of the buttons you would have bought and what's interesting about this one is you know gw for george washington and then around it, it says long live the president and it's funny because that's what we say about a king long live the king um, so again, the language of democracy, we haven't quite learned yet. So where does the president live? Well, in New York, again, they were only there for a short period, uh, but this is on Cherry Street, which is a, about a block or two behind where the building we just saw. Uh, he just had a, a, a house there, a townhouse that they converted to the what they at that time called the president's mansion. Later, it would be known as the president's house, but originally called it the president's mansion. He only lived there for about a year. Uh, it wasn't there for very long. And then if, it, when they moved the government to Philadelphia, this was the house. And I have to be a drawing because unfortunately the house doesn't exist anymore. But this is where Washington finished out his two terms. And then John Adams was here for quite a while. John Adams is the first president to actually live in what we now call the White House in Washington, D.C. He lived there for about a year. Uh, and then it was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, today, if you go to Philadelphia, the, the uh, original house is gone. They've kind of rebuilt some of it to kind of give you a sense of sort of the footprint of the house. Um, and you can go inside and have, again, kind of an exhibit. And then you can see the, in 2007, they had started digging it up, the, the archaeology of it. So you can still see the original foundations. And of course, one of the things they point out is, um, again, this is the beginning of America, democracy, liberty. But of course, this was an age of slavery. And um, Washington owned 300 slaves. Now, he right before he died, he was free his slaves, but, but right before he died. But he had 300 slaves, and he brought at least nine of them that we could document to Philadelphia. So again, this sort of irony that the leader of the free world has slaves you know, who have to work for him. You know, it, anyway. And then, if, you know, the Philadelphia was really hoping that it would just stay in Philadelphia. That was, they had their fingers crossed that it, it would just stay here. So they started building a really fancy house uh, for the president and uh, they never used it. Washington didn't like it. He just thought, I don't need this. I, I'm, you know, I'm out of here anyway. I'm only going to do two terms. And uh, so they never used it. And then later it became part of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but but they, it was always known as the president's building or the president's house or the president's mansion. And then, of course, eventually, uh, when the new capital opened up in 1799, uh, the president's house, uh, later nicknamed the White House, uh, was opened up. And if you look at this one, it's a weird drawing because in 1814, the Canadians, actually 1813, excuse me, the Canadians came down and um, you know, during the War of 1812 and they burnt it down. They destroyed it. And uh, then it was rebuilt in 1815, and that's what we have today. 
So when Washington became president, he had to appoint a cabinet, you know, a group of people that served him. In Britain, they call them ministers, minister of the treasury, minister of war. Here we call them uh, secretaries. So this was the executive branch of the government. Um, today, the executive branch is the largest branch. Most of the things that you think of as the federal government, IRS and the FBI and the CIA and the U.S. military and all of that, Department of Agriculture, Department of State, uh, CDC, all of that's the executive branch. This is it. It was these guys and a couple of clerks that worked for them. And I don't, I'm not going to say you remember all of them, but let me run through the cabinet very quickly. So you had George Washington as president. He was from Virginia. Vice President John Adams from Massachusetts. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, um, Virginia. Henry Knox, Secretary of War, Massachusetts. Edmund Randolph, Secretary of Agriculture, Virginia. Notice the pattern here. And then finally, Alexander Hamilton, who was the Secretary of the Treasurer, he was from New York. So they were all, you know, the executive branch was basically the first two colonies. They were either from Virginia or they were from Massachusetts. Our first six presidents, four of them were from Virginia and two of them from Massachusetts. And the two from Massachusetts were both named Adams. So other than Alexander Hamilton, who was actually born in Jamaica and then moved to New York, they were all Virginians or from Massachusetts. Uh, so again, it's, it is interesting how really those two colonies, later states, kind of ran everything for a long, long time. Um, but what was really fascinating uh, to historians is Washington thought, OK, we're all on the same page. We're all the federal government now we're all going to agree with each other and we're going to make the right decisions, right? And of course, that wasn't the case. You get five people in the room, even today, you're going to get five different opinions. And what you started to get was what we unofficially called parties. You know, there was the anti-administration party and there was the pro-administration party. Um, they'll change their names in a little bit. But we were supposed to not have parties. Parties was an English thing. And even today, you say, partisan politics and people go oh that's awful yuck that's horrible yeah we should never be partisan but what's so funny about that is you hear it today you, you hear the president say this you have members of congress that they'll say that guy's being partisan he's just doing it because that's what democrats want or that guy's being partisan he's just doing what republicans want but it, but no one ever goes i'm being partisan because we always think we're making the right decisions it's those guys who are being partisan but of course everybody thinks they're making the right decision but when it's not your but when you, in other words when you don't agree with that decision then you accuse them of being partisan what i'm trying to say is being partisan is just simply being american it's human you know I, my example of how hard democracy is because democracy is very hard um is whenever you get a group of people, whether, you know, once you get about four or more, like, like I'll take students, like we go to Scotland or I take students to New York one time. And the worst thing ever is when you get together, and you go, hey, it's lunchtime, where you guys wanna eat? Uh, you've already been there. It's, you know, the next hour you're going, well, we'll go to McDonald's, I hate McDonald's, let's go talk about, I hate Taco Bell, let's go to KFC, oh, I can't stand KFC. And what, e what ends up happening is you either, you get uh, one person just says, well, I'm going to McDonald's and I'm driving the car. So you got to go. In other words, somebody either becomes a dictator or what usually happens is you split up into parties. I'm going to, hey, you want to go to McDonald's? Come with me. If you want to go to Taco Bell, go with that guy. If you want to go to KFC, go with that group. It's just normal. If, if this class all got together and said, we're going to be the government, I guarantee within two hours, if not sooner, we would all split up into little parties. It's just normal. There's nothing wrong with that, um, but but we weren't supposed to be parties, which is why even today people are very negative about party politics, and they couldn't believe it. They couldn't agree on anything. Washington was so furious. Washington, the per it's funny we say Washington, we usually mean the government today, but I mean George Washington was furious. And in fact, at one point he grabbed Jefferson and he grabbed Hamilton because those two really hated each other. And he literally threw them up against the wall. 
and basically threatened to punch them until they agreed. And, and they, did, they did make some decisions. So what were these parties? The pro-administration party, uh, and again, they never officially called themselves a party. We wouldn't acknowledge that we actually had parties until the 1820s, even though we did. But the first of these parties was the Federalists. Now, Federalists don't exist anymore. They're going to go away during the War of 1812, but they were one of our initial parties, and they were really the ones in charge. They were the government. Most of the members of Congress were Federalists. Most of the Supreme Court was Federalist. Uh, Washington, Adams, Hamilton, Henry Knox, all Federalists. So anyway, the Federalists uh, were unofficially led by this guy, Alexander Hamilton. What they basically believed is a very strong centralized government. Federalist originally meant those who support the federal government. That was, you know, the, the Constitution. Uh, which is a federal form of government where you split duties between a national government, a state government, and local government. That's federal system, which the Constitution set up. That's what a Federalist originally meant, somebody that supported the Constitution, which was a very strong centralized government. Uh, but over time, again, it became the name used for those who simply supported the, the, the first government, the government of Washington and, and, and of Hamilton and all this. So what they believed in was a strong central government, but, but the focus of the government should be to promote business, industry, manufacturing. And what they argued is that, you know, we have to survive on our own. You know, we're not England anymore. Uh, we have debts to pay. Uh, and the only way we can pay those debts off is we got to start making stuff and selling stuff. We got to start trading not only amongst ourselves, but also trading with other countries. We got to make some money. Um, and, and they're right. What, what you'll find out is that both of these parties, even though they are different, they're both right on some things, just like today. Democrats are right on some things and Republicans are right on some stuff. And you and I, our job is to decide which things they're right about, which things they're not right about. So he is absolutely right about the focus on industry and money. And in fact, if you think today, um, who are the richest people? It's not the farmers. It's it's Jeff Bezos. It, it is uh, Mark Zuckerberg. It, it used to be you know Bill Gates and, and Steve Jobs. You know it's um, you know it's Donald Trump. It, it is man manufacturing was the future. But then it gets into a little creepier stuff. Creepy for us today. People like Hamilton and Adams very much did believe in this natural aristocracy. Aristocracy basically means the elite, you know. And so that what they mean by natural aristocracy is that some people are just born better. Some people are smarter, uh, more moral, better to lead. You know, sometimes people call it the talented, talented tenth that about 10 percent of the population is really really talented and the other 90 percent or whatever that's you know the virtuous few of course of course they're going we're the virtuous few you know hamilton and washington adams we're the that's something you and i would be like mm -mm, no, no you know <laughs> but that's what they believe and again these are the guys that are really afraid of democracy you know, they're the ones that want the electoral college. They're the ones that don't want us voting for senator because they don't think that most of us can make that decision. Only natural aristocracy can make those decisions. To them, democracy is dangerous. It's chaotic. It's funny, I used to have to explain who Hamilton was, but now because of the Broadway musical, everybody sort of knows Hamilton. Uh, maybe if I remember, I'll put a clip from the play. Uh, on, I, I, we'll see if I remember or not, but maybe I'll put a snippet from the play if you haven't seen it yet. But if you didn't know who he was, I mean, the, the easiest way is just, he's the guy in the $10 bill. What's funny about Hamilton is that uh, he really should be more famous. Um, oh, by the way, let me, uh, uh, speaking of the play Hamilton, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the big Broadway play, it's still a big hit. It's been out for many years. Um, but a few years back, they were, you know, we've had people, the same people in our money for a long time now. When we first started money, uh, as a country, we, we didn't put leaders on. We thought that's what you do with a king or an emperor. You don't put political, you know, leaders on. So we had things like, you know, uh, you know, the god Mercury was on our dime and we just have various images. Um, it wasn't until the 20th century that we started putting leaders on our money. And anyway, Hamilton's on our $10 bill and, you know, and some people thought, 
Nobody knows who Hamilton is anymore. Do we need him on our money? There's plenty of other people that could be on our money. And we don't have any people of color on our money. We don't have any women on our money. Maybe it's time to you know, diversify the money. And so the thought was we're going to put Harriet Tubman, the, the African-American woman who was a former slave and helped free people. You know, what a, what a nice symbol for America, somebody who fought for freedom, right? And so they thought, well, we'll put her on the $10 bill and we'll take Hamilton off. And that was the plan. And then the play came out. And everybody went, oh, we like Hamilton now. Hmm. So now, and, and uh, it was supposed to have happened this year, uh, but now it's been postponed. Uh, I don't, I'm, in fact, I'm not sure when it's supposed to happen now. Um, but, but she is supposed to be on the $20 bill because nobody likes Andrew Jackson anymore. So she's going to replace Andrew Jackson. Anyway, uh, Alexander Hamilton should be more famous. Uh, because he really should have been, you know, maybe vice president or president because he was very, very well known and a major player. Uh, but uh, to be president, you have to be born in what is now the United States. He was born in Jamaica, so he couldn't have been president. But back then, people were really, really sensitive to morals. Not that they were any more moral than we were, but, but you know, you're you're what background you had really mattered back then. And he was literally what we call a bat, what we used to call a bastard. A bastard means you're born and your parents aren't married. Today just means like a jerk, you bastard. But it used to, and by the way, in Britain, it's like a major cuss word. Like I'd be bleeped for saying bastard if I was in Britain right now. But that it literally just means your parents aren't married. Who cares? But back then that mattered. The thought was if your parents weren't married when you were born, you come from a bad background, you're an immoral person. Therefore, Hamilton really couldn't make it an elected office. So he always, he was appointed the treasurer. He did a lot of things behind the scenes, but he never was an elected uh, politician because of his background. The other party was uh, the Democratic Republican parties. Um, now again, Federalists go away. This party today would be the Democrats. They, they never, they have stayed the whole time. But to make it really confusing, they used to call themselves Republicans, and then in the 1820s, they started calling themselves Democrats. So it, it does get really confusing when you read old documents. They talk about Republicans, and you're like, Republicans? Because the Republican Party today didn't start till 1854. So to make it so we don't get confused, I will try to always say Democratic Republican. So we know that we're talking about the party in this time period. Because even though this is the modern Democratic Party, they're not the same. Parties change every couple of generations. It, it, it is like apples and oranges, Try, You know, because some students want to say, oh, Federalists are like Republicans and these guys are like Democrats. It's like, well, kind of, but not really, because it was just such a different world back then. But anyway, Democratic Republicans, led unofficially by Jefferson, um, didn't, you know, have some pretty strong differences with Federalists. And, and again, I think, you know, there, there are some things here that we might identify with. Uh, they very much believed in state rights versus federal government. You know, Jefferson was, you know, he was really, he didn't really like the Constitution at first. He wasn't part of that. He was in Paris when that was being created. And he was very uncomfortable with the Constitution and this federal government. I say that, but then he'll spend the next 20 years in that government, Secretary of State under Washington, then becomes Vice President under Adams, and he spends two terms as president. Uh, now, by the time he was president, he liked the federal government and he liked the Constitution, but before he became president, he didn't like it. So he was very much a believer that if there's an issue between the federal government and the state, the state should always be right, not the federal government. Now, again, as president, he won't agree with that. <laughs> Again, it is funny how people speak a different language once, you know, it's like, you know, when, when, you know, you might hate your boss, you hate what the boss does, but once you become boss, sometimes you'll do the same thing. The boss, you're like, oh, that's why the boss was doing it. Hmm. Okay. Anyway. Um, but the, the big difference really here, the two big differences is instead of being about business and because, you know, manufacturing, trading, business, Part of that is also about cities. You need cities for that. You need urban areas. Jefferson very much believed that urban areas, big cities, is that's where corruption is. That's where that's where 
bad morals are that and you know you still see that today a lot of you guys are from a small town i guarantee your parents and your grandparents probably said don't go to atlanta it's terrible there don't go to new york they're nuts there as somebody who's been to both and i used to live in new york and you know i love london I, uh, big cities can be very moral and i think we all know that small towns can be a lot of bad stuff can happen in a small town but there is even today there's still this sense of small town values we're we're nicer it's not necessarily true but that's what we say and that's really that's very jeffersonian and the image of america is the image of a small farmer even though hardly anybody's a farmer even at abac hardly anybody's actually a farmer I've, I've only had two or three students ever major in agriculture, and most of them are doing agricultural business or, you know, that usually to be a full, I have a couple, uh, but not many. And, but yet that's still the image of America. And again, it's a Jeffersonian image. So he felt that what the government should do, the, and it shouldn't do much, but what it should do is focus on farming. We gotta, and he is right. We do have to feed ourselves. But we, but if we're just farming, we're not going to last very long. I mean, what you really need, of course, to do is blend Jefferson and Hamilton together. That's the real answer. Um, but I think the thing that we would still agree with is this idea that this idea of a natural aristocracy, you know, that's out the window. Now, to be fair, Jefferson believed in racial aristocracy because he was a slave owner. And in a modern sense, he would have been a racist, no doubt. He wrote a book called The Notes on Virginia, and he's pretty blunt about the inferiority of African Americans. So in that regard, yes, he would have been believed. And he also believed that men were superior to women, so he would have been a sexist. In fact, he told his daughter that the role of women is to serve men. So I've just made about two thirds of the students hate Jefferson now. Uh, by the way, almost everybody who was white male thought those same things back then. Um, but from the viewpoint of white men, he rejected natural aristocracy. Uh, and he definitely believed that more people should vote. Again, in his case, he just meant white men, but still believed more people should vote. And I think that part, the idea that more people should vote, more people should have a say, uh, I think we can agree with. Um, so when he becomes president, we will see that start to change a little bit. Anyway, um, I know most of this was more kind of preamble, uh, but I, looking at the clock, I know I've gone well over an hour. In fact, I'm, I'm right at an hour and 15 minutes, so this is about the time of one class. So I think I'll pause it here, and we'll make this part one, and then I'll later record part two. Um, again, because I know, uh, it, even if I didn't do this, I know you guys are all hitting the pause button anyway, so I think that's more than long enough. Uh, so when we get to part two, we'll start talking about what were the actual issues, what were the actions of the 1790s. Okay, thanks guys, and I'll talk to you later.